I call to order and welcome you to the Middletown, Ohio Special Meeting of City Council for Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. Please join me for a moment of meditation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag. You will hear three taps of the gavel when it is time to stand. Please join me in a moment of meditation now. Clerk of Council, Ms. Skank, please call the attendance roll. Mr. Farrell? Here. Mrs. Carter? Here. Mr. West? Here. Mr. Horn? Here. Mayor Slamka? Here. Thank you. And this evening we have a presentation uh, of a proclamation for National Public Health Week. Proclamation. Whereas, oh, by the way, before I begin, National Health Week did happen this past week, but we're going to go ahead and read this anyway and kind of declare it the health month. Whereas the week of April 1st through 7th, 2024 is National Public Health Week, and the theme is protecting, connecting, and thriving, we are all public health. And whereas feeling like we belong, being a part of our communities, and fostering cultural connections supports our health and the quality of our lives, and whereas to celebrate the 29th National Public Health Week this year, there are daily themes. Monday is civic engagement. Tuesday is healthy neighborhoods. Wednesday is climate change. Thursday is new tools and innovations. Friday is reproductive and sexual health. Saturday is emergency preparedness. And Sunday is the future of public health. And whereas since 1995, the American Public Health Association, through its sponsorship of National Public Health Week, has educated the public, policymakers, and public health professionals about these issues important to improving the public's health. And whereas public health professionals help communities prevent, prepare for, withstand, and recover from the impact of a full range of health threats, including disease outbreaks such as the COVID-19 pandemic and natural disasters and disasters caused by human activity. And whereas public health action, together with scientific and technological advances, has played a major role in reducing, and in some cases, eliminating the spread of infectious disease and in establishing today's disease surveillance and control systems. Now, therefore, I, Elizabeth Slamka, Mayor of the City of Middletown, Ohio, do hereby proclaim the week of April 1st through 7th, 2024, as National Public Health Week 2024 in the City of Middletown, Ohio, and call upon the residents to observe these themes by helping our families, friends, neighbors, coworkers, and leaders to better understand the value of public health and support great opportunities to adopt preventative lifestyle habits. Dated in Middletown, Ohio, this second day of April, 2024. Thank you. This is our health commissioner, <laughs> Jackie Phillips Carter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if I can call Christy, Durich, and Deanna, Shores up with me really quick. I'm trying to make sure we keep making a point that all of us are public health. We all are public health. And the theme of public health, when we talk about civic engagement or more importantly, let's talk about maternal, black maternal health week starts today. And it's um, all week. So all these themes should be practiced throughout the year of how we take care of one another, how we connect. And I love this when it said, and the theme is protecting, connecting, and thriving. We are all public health. And so I bring Middletown Connect partners up here. That's exactly what we're trying to do. And had this happened last week, I could say, the stars are aligning and not <laughs> be talking about the eclipse. But 
It is very rewarding and satisfying to know that as we start doing things in our community, that it all starts coming together and making sick, uh, sense. We cannot do it without each other. And as our city manager always says, we're better together, and we truly are. So I wanted to make sure that if you guys had anything to say about how important Middletown Connect is, these are, public health has eight people in the department, right? And that's including me. With Middletown Connect, we have more hands, more feet out doing things in the community, connecting the community, making all of our resources and leveraging all of our resources to get things done. So thank you. And I like to look at people in the eyes so you can't roll them at me. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you do. Love you, love Middletown. The next order of business is citizen comments. Please read, as we get it on the screen here, please read bullet point number four of our citizen comments guidelines on the screen behind us as it pertains to your presentations. A respectful professional presentation is expected. Personal attacks on staff, council members, or other individuals will not be tolerated. There will be no foul language. This is not a time for debate, questions and answer, or any back and forth conversation. This is a time for you, our residents, to be able to present to council on record, uninterrupted, and have the floor. We have received two comment cards this evening. I would like to call Mary Johnson to the podium. <coughs> Please state your full name and middle town <coughs> residence or work address for the record. Please address the council as a whole. You will have four minutes of uninter <laughs> uninterrupted speech. Please commence. Uh, thank you. My name is Mary Vegas Johnson, and I live at 6700 Locust Lane, which is frankly a mailing address, but it's Middletown, really. Um, I am the current chair of the DMI Board of Directors, a volunteer position. All of us at DMI, board members, staff, and our army of volunteers passionately believe our historic downtown is important because it's the heart of Middletown. And having a healthy heart is essential to having a strong hometown community and a strong city. My husband and I moved to Middletown 34 years ago and we got married so we could split the commute. My husband heading north on I-75 to Wright Pad Air Force Base, me heading south on I-75 first to Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals and then to Procter & Gamble. If we wanted to hang out with friends, we had to hit the highway again. We didn't find much to do in Middletown back then, especially downtown. Since then, the tireless efforts of the people that came before me have transformed our downtown business by business into a great place to spend time with family and friends. In fact, we met our gang of friends at Canal House, spoken more recently at New Wales and Gravel Road. You might notice the theme here. My husband is a craft beer fanatic. Among our dearest friends are downtown Middletown small business owners, employees, and regulars. We absolutely love the sense of community that we have in Middletown. It is special and something you won't find in Austin Landing or Westchester and that makes us unique. I'm retired from P&G nearly three years ago as a scientific communications director. Through DMI, I'm thrilled to be able to apply my corporate communications management skills to the revitalization of downtown Middletown. In fact, it's my new part-time job. The pay is crap, nothing, but the job satisfaction is amazing. One of the biggest perks to volunteering with DMI is that I get to collaborate with passionate people from other Middletown organizations. A great example is the Planning for Darkness Steering Committee, which included members from the city of Middletown, Travel Butler County, Miami University Regionals, Midpoint Library Middletown, the Middletown City School District, the Weekend Business Incubator, and the Miami Valley Astronomical Society. So it was quite a group. Our goals were twofold. First, help people who live and work in Middletown to experience what will be for most a once in a lifetime event safely. Secondly, boost our downtown businesses by encouraging people to view the eclipse in Middletown. The steering committee collaborated on educational presentations and the creation of an education and safety brochure that's been distributed to all the students and staff in the school district. That's over 16,000 people. You all have a copy of that yourselves that I just um, had given Amy. We created a Planning for Darkness event page featuring Eclipse business specials that had 1,600 visitors yesterday alone. And thanks to Travel Butler County and the city of Middletown, we were also able to distribute hundreds of free Eclipse viewing glasses through our downtown businesses and at yesterday's viewing event, which hosted people who traveled from as far away as Alabama. 
visitors who shopped, ate, and drank in Middletown and spent their money in Middletown. No matter how hard we work to revitalize our downtown, sometimes it feels like we're slipping backwards. This is especially true of the vacancy rates in our downtown buildings, which grew from 47% in 2023 to 53% in 2024. That's why we need to push hard to look for solutions to our vacancy problem, because downtown revitalization goes hand in hand with increased occupancy. Next week, on April 16th, DMI is hosting a Heritage Ohio workshop on vacant property legislation. We urge all of you to register and attend. And on June 10th, DMI is hosting a presentation by 3CDC, the group that revitalized Cincinnati's over the, wine, over the Rhine region. I'm thinking wind, wine, and chocolate walk over the wine. Uh, we'll be sending everyone to save the date in the next few weeks. We hope to see you at these presentations so that together we can develop solutions that will fit the challenges faced by our downtown community. That's Thank time. Thank you for your continuing support. Thank you, Mary Johnson. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would like to now um, call Steve Wayne to the podium. Please state your full name and Middletown residence or work address for the record. Please address the council as a whole. You will have four minutes of uninterrupted speech. Please commence. Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Wayne, and I work at Miami Middletown on University Boulevard. I'm a resident of Westchester, but of course work here in Middletown. I've worked at uh, MUM for about five years. Um, I am also a retiree from Procter & Gamble. When I took the job at Miami Middletown, I wanted to get involved in the community, and so I reached out, tried to find some things that I could connect with. Uh, I became a volunteer at the Sorg Opera House, which I really, uh, really enjoy. Um, and I also joined uh, Downtown Middletown, Inc., DMI. And I'm now uh, a member of the board at DMI. And uh, I've also, I've donated to DMI and I've also encouraged uh, some of my friends to also donate to DMI. Um, one of the purposes of DMI is to, of, cor uh, of course, encourage business in the central business district of Middletown, but also my goal at MUM is to attract and retain talent here in Middletown. So try to get internships and full-time jobs for students at Miami Middletown and hoping that they'll stay here, raise a family, and it'll continue. Um, I really enjoy the events that uh, are put on by DMI. Um, the Donut Walk on Fat Tuesday in February is a blast. The Girl Scout Cookie Walk in March. And of course, the Women's Wine and Chocolate uh, Walk in May uh, is coming up very soon. I'm also a lover of the Ugly Donut at Central Pastry. And I love Gravel Road and New Ales Brewery. So definitely like all the socialization possibilities here in uh, downtown Middletown. Uh, so I, as I close, I would just like to say thank you very much, and I hope that you will uh, help DMI thrive and continue to attract and retain talent in Middletown. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wayne. <clears throat> that, concludes, that concludes our public participation. The next agenda item is council comments. We will begin to my left with Council Member Farrell, <coughs> followed by Council Member Carter. And then to my right with Council Member West, followed by Council Member Horn. I will speak last. Mr. Farrell? Thanks, Mayor. Uh, just a couple of things. I don't have much of a voice, so I'll be quick. But uh, I'd say the big news over the last few weeks for Middletown, other than the eclipse, is uh, the, the growth of uh, Cleveland Cliffs. I think to your point, uh, keeping the talent and the, acquiring the talent, um, you can acquire it, but you have to keep it here. So I look around and I, I look at, I've sold three of my rental houses in the last couple of months. And, Exciting for me is uh, one couple was from Germantown, one couple was from Fairfield, and one couple was from Hamilton. And then I look at the pride of, uh, the mayor and I had the honor to uh, actually go to the announcement of uh, the hydrogen art furnaces um, and, and see the CEO of Cleveland Cliffs and, and all the employees that were there and just the pride they have for the work that they do and the city that they live in and the city that they represent. So I, I, I look forward and I, I try to look forward to where we're at and I, I look around at our this is going to be my goal for the next two years, I've decided, which housing has always been a goal of mine. But I, I look around, and I see people wanting to be here, and I look around, and I, I see three or four houses on the market. And, and how do we fix that? I, we're about to have over 1,000 highly skilled, trained people come in to build this thing for the next four to five years. And then long term, hundreds of, once again, highly skilled, trained, and well-paid people. 
and we don't really have the housing for that right now. We don't have the ability to support that. So for me, we have to get busy trying to keep these people here. We want them to work here, obviously. That puts money into our income tax, but a city is more than money. We have to be able to give these people what they want. So I, I know staff's been on this, and that's something I want to fully support. But uh, I think Middletown, we have a chance here to not just be some city that people come and drive on the roads and leave. And obviously, you want fire, you want police, uh, these types of things. That's the basic goals of government, which is the things that we have to do. And Middletown's always done. But we have a shot to actually be a town where people want to be at for the first time in a long time, if I can boldly say. Um, so I'm really excited for it. Uh, this council and this staff has a, a big shot that maybe we haven't had in the last 20, 30 years. So I'm really excited for the future. And uh, you know, I, I just, and I know in talking to council, I, I, I hope that we're all in this together and I know that we're all in this together to be a city where not only people come, but they stay. So that's all I have, Mayor, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Ms. Carter? Good evening. I too am uh, proud of this city. Um, I see growth and I see a lot of things happening. I myself am a certified community health worker and I've been one for 14 years. So the community has really been forefront in my mind. As, uh, as our health commissioner said, this is the Black Maternal Health Week and I'm having a celebration at my church for Black Maternal Health Week. So if any of you would like to come, you're welcome. Be good to see you understand what is going on with our women here in Middletown. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Mr. West. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, feels like forever since we've met, but uh, a lot going on in the community. It's kind of hard to go third. Uh, a lot of things have been covered, but uh, this Friday is the first food truck Friday at sunset. So look forward to seeing a lot of people out there. I think the rain's gonna move out Friday morning as of the forecast this morning could have changed. But uh, so looking forward to that. Um, the other thing was uh, right before the eclipse started, I kind of drove around the city and it was, it was really nice to see so many people outside, families, um, whether they were downtown or at a park or even just collectively uh, in their front yards, neighbors, friends, relatives. Um, it kind of reminded me of, you know, when I was a kid before, you know, iPads and stuff like that. So it was, it was a nice event um, and it was good to see everybody out. Um, other than that, um, I don't have much else. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. West. Mr. Horn. Good evening. I just want to uh, just reiterate again the comments I made about a month or so ago. Uh, if, it's April now, so the um, property taxes are now here. So, and as I said before um, in my previous comments, unfortunately you missed the deadline to um, question the evaluation, but you still can go to Butler County and if you're having an issue paying the, the increase, you can have a conversation with them about setting up a payment plan. I'd also encourage anyone, and especially our older citizens over 65, uh, you can get the Homestead Act uh, enacted if you haven't already done that, which uh, that takes 26500 off your evaluation of your property. Um, Butler County is really wanting to work with our citizens with the now reality. I know we want to look always toward the future and plan ahead, but this is something that's going to be here for three years uh, for now. And I would just encourage those to uh, utilize uh, these services and, ha and just have a conversation with them. Um, when the Butler County Auditor was talking about it, he said our, our last resort is, is we're gonna go case by case if someone just cannot uh, take, um, take on this uh, added burden. And to me, with our citizens who are on fixed incomes and are older, uh, they deserve every bit of help that uh, our county uh, can give them. And, and our city helped our citizens here. Um, so that's all I can say about that, but I just want to encourage everyone to take advantage of every opportunity you can with this. Yield to you, Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Horn. I have several comments this evening. Um, first of all, I wanted to start with April is Earth Month. It's a special time set aside to consider the planet and the critters, waterways and forests, jungles, oceans, and you name it, and how we all share this one home together. And we have several ways of celebrating some of which I will touch upon during my comments. For now, 
I will simply announce that Arbor Day is Friday, April 26th. Earth Day is Monday, April 22nd. Clean Up Middletown through Keep Middletown Beautiful is Saturday, April 27th. And there's more to come on all of those. Uh, just a couple things going on this past few weeks. Uh, Friday, March 22nd, I attended Dodgeball Day at Mayfield School. I was welcomed by Mrs. Schmidt, the school secretary, and given a wonderful office tour by Principal Heather Keel, who has been at Mayfield for eight years. And what a beautiful school. The staff and teachers and even the offices are so welcoming. The children had a wonderful time playing dodgeball against the teachers, and I look forward to visiting the school again. On Saturday, March 23rd, I was invited to Al Bayan Academy, this tri-state area's first Muslim high school. Their holy month of Ramadan is being celebrated right now, and it was an honor to be invited to break the fast with the school leaders and members of the community. I was able to speak to the assembly a few moments, have a tour of the school, and meet some of the incredible teachers and people that bring that school to life. I'm so grateful to the committee that brought Albayan to Middletown and look for more good things to come. On Monday, we spoke, uh, Council Person uh, Farrell spoke about this, March 25th, our city manager, Paul Lally, both assistant city managers, Ashley Combs and Nathan K. Hall, Zach Farrell and I were all able to attend the Cleveland Cliffs announcement of the possible $500 million grant of the United States Department of Energy to the Cleveland Cliffs Middletown Works facility. In attendance were the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, and Cleveland Cliffs CEO, Lorenzo Consalves. This grant would go towards, a, like we were, has been said, a hydrogen-ready direct reduced iron plant and two electric melting furnaces. And this project will secure the existing 2,500 jobs at Middletown Works while also adding 170 plus new good paying jobs to our city. The design and construction phases of the facility will bring nearly 1,200 construction jobs to Middletown until completion, which is estimated to be near the end of 2028 or 2029. This project will draw innovation, economic development, and forward thinking talent to our city. This is an enormous win for the city of Middletown and our residents securing good paying jobs for generations to come. I would like to thank our city staff and former mayor Nicole Condry, who wrote a letter to the Department of Energy for all they did to ensure that the, this project came to Middletown. On Tuesday, March 26th, I was invited to Atrium Medical Center to take a tour of, and meet some of the board members and professionals there. I was greeted very warmly and learned so much. Not only do we have a level three trauma center and primary stroke center, but I learned that we have a natural beginnings birth center Atrium Medical Center, which is, I believe, the only one in the tri-state area. Here, they offer, among other things, cozy family rooms with a roomy, regular-sized bed, a way for you to have your doula or midwife with you, water birth and hydrotherapy, non-separation of mother and newborn, and emergency medical care, and a level two special care nursery is just down the hall should complications arise. Program enrollment is required, and not all pregnancies can be accommodated. Please contact Atrium Medical Center if you're interested. The Natural Beginnings Birth Center at Atrium Medical, Care, uh, Medical Center is quite unique and a wonderful option right here in Middletown. On Wednesday, March 27th, we had a ribbon cutting right here in the city building for Brenda's City Cafe. Located on the ground floor next to the Municipal Court, Brenda's City Cafe is open weekdays from 8 to 2 p.m. There are delicious items on the menu, including the popular biscuits and gravy and a spruced up new look. I encourage you to visit and say hello to Brenda. Uh, as was said before, Downtown Middletown, Inc. had the, um, the eclipse, the uh, planning for darkness. That was a wonderful event. If you were able to come downtown, it was absolutely incredible. And look for more great events from DMI in the city of Middletown in the upcoming weeks and months. Speaking of which, as uh, Councilperson uh, West mentioned, we have the uh, Food Truck Friday this Friday, April 12th, from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. at Sunset Park. The theme is Opening Day. And there will be Cincinnati Reds character meet and greet from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. And then from 7.30 to 9, there will be live music from RLH, or Real Live Humans. To find out more, please visit our city's Facebook page. Middletown City Events, headed by Jerry Lewis, is doing great work providing residents and visitors with fun for the entire family, and I hope you will attend. The um, mentioned Black Maternal Health Week, um, I guess the, um, what, would, what do we call it, like a clinic, health clinic? Uh, this Saturday is uh, at the United Missionary Baptist Church. This is what Ms. Carter was talking about. I just wanted to tell you where that is at. And residents may have noticed the colorful billboards around the city announcing Middletown's Trash Bash citywide cleanup. This will take place on Saturday, April 20th from 8.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Drop-off locations include Lefferson Park, the bus stop depot uh, downtown, Douglas Park, and Middletown High School. 
City staff will be on hand to direct traffic and verify resident addresses as ID will be necessary to utilize the services. Car and passenger truck tires, which are off the rim and no semi tires, please, plus free on appliances such as refrigerators, freezers, and window AC units will be accepted only at the Middletown High School location. Otherwise, trash and furniture will be accepted at all locations. But please be aware that residents must be able to unload all the items they bring themselves. Also later that day will be a Midpoint Library System April Community Partner event. This will include free health screenings and services offered by Atrium Medical Center and Premier Community Health on Saturday, April 20th, from 3 to 6 p.m. at Midpoint, Midpoint Library in Middletown in the community room. There will be free drop-in health screenings for things like blood pressure, blood glucose, cholesterol, and hemoglobin A1C, education, influenza vaccinations, and more. I want to thank Midpoint Library in Middletown and our Atrium and Premier Partners. And lastly, Council will be voting for board and commissions tonight, so if you have sent in your application, that will be completed this evening. Also, as a reminder, the City of Middletown accepts applications for our boards and commissions throughout the year, so if there is something that you have in, an interest in and you wish to give back to your city, please do submit your application. And that's all for me tonight. This concludes our council comments. Next item on the agenda is a city manager's report. City manager, Mr. Lally, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Slamka and uh, members of council. I have a couple things uh, this evening for city manager's report. The first on the item is, uh, or on the agenda is I'd like to invite downtown Middletown Inc. up to the podium to give council an annual report on downtown Middletown Inc. And I'd like to invite Mary Johnson and uh, Jeff Payne to give you this presentation. Welcome. Hello again. We're going to make this quick. So I'm Mary Johnson. This is our executive director, Jeff Payne. Next slide, please. As I spoke earlier, I think we are all part of DMI. We are very passionate about downtown. We believe that downtowns are the heart of a community. And a healthy community and a healthy city are dependent upon a healthy downtown. So this is where our passion lies, and this is where the work of DMI focuses. I'm making Middletown the kind of place that people want to move to. They want to work here, and they want to live here. Um, and I think, you know, there's lots of rooms for partnerships and opportunities with all of you guys, because I, I think our objectives really do align. Uh, next slide, please. Who is Downtown Middletown, Inc.? We are a 501c3 registered organization. We are a nonprofit. We're actually part of a much larger organization. The mother organization is called Heritage Ohio. We're part of a number of communities such as Newark, Sandusky, uh, and oh. others within Ohio who are part of Heritage Ohio, which again has a mother parent, which is called Main Street America. Main Street America is, I think, across 40 city, state, regional coordinating programs. It's a subsidiary of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And it's also quite strict. We have to go through an annual accreditation program. So we just received accreditation based on the work that we did in 2023. And this will be our eighth consecutive year of accreditation with Main Street America. Next slide, please. DMI's missions and beliefs. Our mission is to build. Build a vibrant community, unify downtown's businesses and organizations, improve downtown's image and appearance, leverage historic preservation, develop a strong economic base. We have some very heartfelt beliefs. We believe that our, we are committed to creating a place of shared prosperity, equity, and inclusive engagement. We believe that by creating a vibrant downtown, we can help increase the quality of life for all of Middletown citizens. Next slide, please. We have Main Street America prescribes a four-point approach. There is no magic bullet to revitalizing a community, revitalizing a downtown. In their experience, again, based across the swath of the United States, it takes four points. And our committees within DMI are aligned with these four points. The one I think that we're best known for, because it's the most obvious, is our promotions committee, which is also our events committee. So events like Hocus Pocus, Win Wine and Chocolate Walk are part of our events committee. And the goal here is to bring feet indoors. So for example, with our viewing event, we minimized the food trucks for that particular event because we wanted people to go into our restaurants. We wanted them to go into our bars. We wanted them to experience downtown, yet you know, having some cool food trucks like the funnel cake one. 
Uh, the rest of our committees are the Economic Vitality Committee, which we really want to work very closely with uh, you all to enact vacant property legislation and enforcement. So that's a key goal of ours. Uh, the Design Committee, I happen to be chair of that, which is enhancing physical and visual uh, assets within downtown. So in partnership with Art Central Foundation, we are resurrecting our mural program, which I think is a great way of, you know, kind of fake it till you make it, look amazing and great, you know, in a way that reflects your community as you bring, you know, kind of the harder pieces to bear where you improve the overall appearance. And then the organization committee, which is about partnerships. Our mantra is communication and collaboration. So we're partnering with a lot of organizations within downtown and uh, providing resources. Next slide, please. Our staff is highly qualified. Uh, Jeff himself has um, experience in urban planning, in historic preservation, economic development. Other staff members have experience in information management, social media, and marketing. Our board of directors is 100% volunteer based. As I said, the crap is paid, but the job satisfaction is amazing. Uh, we are, I like to say, not a prestige board. We're a roll up your sleeves and get stuff done board. So for example, Jeff and I rolled up our sleeves and we emptied the trash bins after the Eclipse viewing event, because that's what we do. We want to keep Middletown beautiful, and we do what we need to do. So we all out there volunteering and um, working to beautify and make downtown more vibrant. And I see the rest of my time to my colleague, Jeff. Thank you very much, Mary. And uh, also, I want to congratulate all of you. Uh, I think this is our first time coming before the board, so. All right, new elected officials. All right, thank you. So next slide, please. So I want to talk just briefly about our impact. Uh, we do not spend a lot of time talking about what we do because we're really just focused on working and collaborating with other organizations so that we can get the work done. Uh, one of the things that is most important is to understand that our entire focus is for the downtown. We are solely committed to working. That's our service area. And so when we advocate, we're advocating in such a way that we are trying to bring to bear the best opportunities for the businesses, the building owners, the residents, anyone, everyone that's associated with downtown. Uh, so we have uh, a number of tools that we use. For example, uh, early on, and this is Prior to my coming here, we set up a micro loan program with uh, First Financial, and uh, it was seeded with $100,000. This is a, it's a low interest loan. Basically, what it does is that uh, as a business comes in, they can use this for various types of improvements, and they pay this back over a four year period. Uh, we probably have now about $86,000 still available in that uh, in that account. What we're trying to do is come up with ways to encourage businesses to uh, seek to be a part of this. We work with the city's uh, SBDC uh, office, Dave Riggs in particular. He helps to uh, put together the uh, business plans so that uh, they can be, these are bankable uh, loans because uh, that's very important. Another thing that we've done over the years is over 55,000 people have been brought into downtown uh, Middletown, uh, 90 plus sponsored uh, events. We've established, we established the designated outdoor recreation area. This was the first in the state of Ohio. And uh, one of the things that we found through COVID, um, many other communities looked to us to give them advice on how to make this work. Because of course, as you know, when we were social distancing, Outdoors was about the only place you could add to your, to your business. Um, we uh, worked with the city on doing uh, facade improvements. Um, on record, we know of at least nine that we uh, worked on, and at that point, that was up to about 2018. Uh, that program has kind of shifted a little bit, but we certainly uh, would like to uh, continue to work in that area. Uh, we've helped to create the downtown entertainment district, that was very important because that's what has allowed us to bring more bars and restaurants into the downtown. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have uh, used our assets to help other organizations do events downtown. Uh, we have uh, a particular type of insurance 
that allows uh, activities like uh, Port Middletown, Art and Music Festival, Holiday Hoopla, they work with us. Uh, there are certain costs. When you are attempting to use any public space, uh, the city will not allow you to use that public space unless we can indemnify the city. And we carry the type of insurance that allows that to happen. And so that's a cost that these other organizations do not have to bear because we are in collaboration with them. So you might hear about them, but we're also in partnership with them. Uh, and then finally, uh, just one of my favorites uh, is, you know that light that sits there at Broad and Central Avenue? You know, when you hit it and it goes yellow and hopefully the cars will slow down? That's one of the early activities that uh, DMI uh, was involved in. Next slide, please. Okay, just want to talk a little bit about our results. Again, uh, I'm not trying to toot our horn a whole lot, but since we got the floor, I might as well say something. Um, each year, uh, we are required as part of our accreditation to track the volunteer hours that uh, are given, that are provided to us in service by our board members, by our committees, et cetera. And uh, I, I have to say that Actually, my board members and our committees do not report accurately. They actually under-report, and I'm constantly on them about that. But last year, uh, we were able to uh, accurately report 4,084 hours. And uh, based upon the uh, dollar amount that the IRS allows, uh, which was $29.95 per hour, uh, that generated over $122,000 in uh, free labor, how you, <laughs> how you want to consider it. Um, then uh, approximately, we had approximately 10,800 visitors in our downtown last year. Now that number does not include uh, what Holiday Hoopla brought in. So this is just the events that we know that we were responsible for. And when uh, you look at that, uh, each, time we have an event, on average, and we were using Heritage Ohio's number, uh, a family will spend or an individual will spend roughly about $20 uh, per person when they come downtown. Uh, and so that is a multiplier in, a, in effect. And so what that has equal to, that's generated $216,000 in sales to our businesses, whether they be a boutique, a restaurant, a bar, uh, whatever, downtown. So this is money that we're generating uh, just through by that foot traffic that we bring down. Um, so if we kind of total that, we're looking at about $338,000 plus of revenue that we brought into downtown just last year alone. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, we... Uh, have since the uh, beginning of the organization received $25,000 each year for our, our work. Now, our, just to be very honest, our operating revenue our op or our operating budget is about $150,000 a year. And that takes, that's all our mission, paying for my salary. Uh, also, those little, when you come downtown, if you get some little swag item or something that the kids get, that's all a part of that. Uh, that money's also monies that we have leveraged to do all of the various events. And so uh, what that does, what we're looking at is a 13 to one return on investment for the city's uh, investment in our organization. Uh, by p and standards, and I, I, I referred that to Mary, that's about a two to one is considered very profitable. So I think we're a real bargain for downtown, but that's primarily because of the fact that you have this army of volunteers who are just totally committed to wanting to serve their community. Uh, in fact, yesterday we, we uh, met a young lady who was so excited by what was going on and she started to get emotional. She now wants to work with us and so I told her, I gave her my card, I said please reach out because you have a skill set, a special skill set 
that we can use and we'll put you to work. So uh, that, that's very important. Uh, the next item, thank you. Um, for 2024, we actually, um, we know that we can bring traffic downtown. That's very important. But I will tell you, when people come into your community, when, I know uh, I, I live in Montgomery County. When I go downtown to my uh, home community, I try to see what changes are occurring. And I'm always looking to see what's positive. And so we want to, a real sign of growth might be incremental growth, but we need to show that. And so just bringing people downtown is really not all that needs to happen. We need to begin to help change the appearance of downtown. And that's part of the, what the, the four point uh, program does. So uh, for example, uh, we've gone through, uh, we've worked with uh, uh, the microloan program, like I said. Uh, we're, we're doing events that are attempting to uh, deal with our new strategic plan. That strategic plan involves us putting together work plans so that we're very strategic, that we're very focused on the items that we need to do. Uh, we've had some, some challenges where we've had to work uh, a little extra hard. We don't have a visitor's bureau right now. So that means that we, we collaborate and reach out to other organizations to help us get the word out. Um, we uh, also want to do uh, certain things with other partnerships. We're always looking to build additional partnerships. And uh, as you can see, uh, we've, we've had a number of those and we're continuing to look to build even more. Um, I want to just again invite you to our quarterly uh, training uh, event on April the 16th. Um, I've been going to these events every year, four times a year, but in other communities. The one thing that I found is that when you go to another community, you, you, you see that they have similar challenges just like we do. And what you learn from that is sort of how they addressed it. So we're all uh, really working towards the same goal, improving our downtown, making our downtown a place for uh, others to want to come. Um, you, you spoke this evening about the, uh, the, um, the work that's going to be happening with Cliffs, Cleveland Cliffs, and all the new people that are going to be wanting, wanting to come and move to Middletown. Well, guess what? There are going to be people who are my age, people who are much younger, they're gonna all have different desires and different tastes for housing. And so we believe downtown provides one of those uh, markets. And so that's one of the reasons why we want to do some of the things that we've been talking about. For example, the vacant property legislation. We wanna turn these upper floor uh, units into places where uh, people will want to live, work, and play. And then, of course, that involves us dealing with the first, the ground floors as well. So uh, I don't want to spend too much more time. I just want to say that we appreciate all the support that we get from the city. We enjoy collaboration. Uh, I carry my card around, and I'm giving it to anybody who's willing to allow me to, to give my spiel. Uh, so again, I just want to thank you. Uh, we want to thank city staff for all their support and uh, we're available to answer any questions. Thank you, Mary and Jeff. We look forward to working with you in 2024 and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next under city manager, rear, let me start over. <laughs> Next on the city manager's report is our Middletown Municipal Court update. So I would like to invite Judge Jamie Sharon and Steve, are you coming up with him or? <laughs> Thank you, Judge Sharon. Making me fend for myself. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for giving me a few minutes. I won't take up too much time. Um, to annually, the uh, council has provided our annual physical report. You have that, you're provided that already before this evening. Uh, if you have any questions about that, please do not ask me. I won't have an answer. That man over there has all the answers. He probably knows probably the city budget also. Um, but what I wanted to do this year was 
uh, maybe broaden that out a little bit and give you an annual report, which we just provided to you just before council. Uh, it's just a more um, educational, holistic uh, view of the court. Uh, I think it's very helpful to look at. I'm not going to go over everything that's in the report. What I am going to do is uh, just address some, uh, just a few issues that the court's uh, dealing with. Um, some of the current challenges that we're dealing with, uh, as you may know, there's been a huge, not only expansion of victims' rights in Ohio, but uh, it was it was um, put into uh, it was it was turned into revised code ordinances this year. Uh, it is very it's probably 40, 50 pages of new law that we deal with. Um, you know, victims have always been uh, well addressed in our court, and what's happened now is it's expanded greatly. Like, for example, you know, you think of somebody as a victim, maybe somebody of a violent crime, thing of that nature. Well, now a criminal trespass, there's a victim. They have certain rights now that they didn't used to have. They have the right to notification, they have the right to uh, proceedings, the right to have a voice in the court, the right to be notified of. Uh, uh, anything that happens with the defendant in a case. So it's a, a pretty huge expansion and it's been a burden for the court. It's been a burden for the prosecutor's office uh, with our victim's advocate. So we're dealing with that. Um, expungements has been a really uh, big topic for the courts in the last year or so. It's a moving target because legislation keeps uh, popping up that expands or modifies uh, expungements. Uh, expungements is a good thing, obviously. Um, uh, sometimes, well, what some of the legislators are doing, they're, they're trying to make expan uh, expungements automatic and take it away the, the discretion of the court. Sometimes there's victims involved in these cases, which is obviously impacted by that. So we're dealing with those issues also. Uh, we are also dealing with uh, a huge influx in interpreter cases. We now have a uh, Spanish-speaking interpreter uh, on our Friday morning dockets because we just had so many Spanish-speaking cases uh, that we're, we're trying to deal with them all at once uh, so that we can uh, be more efficient with them. Uh, it's not just Spanish. Uh, we had a Uzbeki. I mean, we get all of them. You'd be amazed how many different languages there are in uh, our community. Uh, so we're addressing those issues. Another thing that uh, has been increasing lately are um, competency evaluations and mental health issues. Uh, I've been on the bench for coming up on seven years now, and the thing that has surprised me more than anything else in my job is the depth and breadth of mental health issues. I had no idea that it was as pervasive as it is. It's um, uh, a lot of it is caused, uh, it's organic, but a lot of it is drug related. Um, methamphetamine has become much more common in uh, use in Middletown and, and now the court's dealing with that also. You take meth long enough, it rots your brain. It makes you permanently psychotic. We have people in court that, you know, I, I've, I've met two angels now. I've met the Archangel David and uh, you know, who knew? Uh, these people that they honestly believe these things that, you know, uh, and they're Unfortunately, it becomes permanent, and they become permanently incompetent. So we're trying to deal with those issues. We're trying to uh, provide services to those people. We have uh, treatment providers embedded into every docket now. So anytime there's an open court and there's a person with a substance abuse issue or a mental health issue, they will they at least have the opportunity to be uh, uh, talked to right then, right there, just before, or just after every court session. So I think that's uh, a huge, um, of, of great assistance to us. Um, we are trying to improve our access to justice. Um, eventually, we will have all e tickets uh, from the police department, hopefully. Right? Where is it? Um, that's, uh, it'll be so much more efficient for police officers. They won't have to just uh, sit in their squad cars writing out tickets and uh, it'll, it'll be all computerized. It'll be just generated straight to the court, straight to the headquarters. Uh, E-search warrants will also greatly benefit the police. Um, I get 
I probably sign half a dozen warrants each week. Uh, sometimes it's uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon, sometimes it's at three o'clock in the morning uh, with this system. And sometimes, unfortunately, there'll be something wrong with a search warrant, a police officer's come out to my house, there's police officers standing by at a residence and they can't go into the residence until they get a search warrant. They send a, an officer out to my house to uh, sign a search warrant. Let's say there's something wrong with it, has to they have to go back to headquarters, fix it, send it back out. With this, they don't. They they uh, uh, they they write up the warrant. They email it to me. They send me a text or a call. I'd call them back, uh, swear them in on on uh, either uh, on the phone or by video, and it's done. It's so much more efficient for them. So we're working on that. We were just at a technology conference last week that uh, was addressing that specific issue. Um, One of the, we have a new Chief Justice as of last year uh, for the Ohio Supreme Court. Uh, she has prioritized uh, clearance rates of, of cases. Uh, it's called overage. Uh, any case that's of a certain age. Uh, Middletown Municipal Court, we probably have just maybe four or five cases that are, that are over. And some of those, like uh, we have one that's uh, set for a jury trial in a couple weeks. It's, it's takes time to have a jury trial. Uh, some courts, not too far from here, have had four or 500 overage cases. So we're doing pretty darn well addressing our overage. Uh, we have a, uh, the state has a new um, restitution escrow fund that we're trying to um, utilize. It's for uh, restitution for victims of crimes. Um, other things that we're addressing, actions to improve physical uh, status. We've increased collections through warrant blocks and licenses. Uh, so many of the cases that we get, driving under suspension charges, no operator's license. Uh, on all cases that we get, there's so many failure to appears uh, that we issue warrants. Um, eventually, we do the warrant blocks and the license forfeitures. A um, couple other things that I just wanted to hit on. Uh, we have a veterans treatment court. It's a certified docket. Ohio has uh, uh, moved towards uh, specialized dockets. You have mental health dockets. You have uh, uh, drug and alcohol dockets. People ask me if our court has a drug court. I tell them that we are a drug court. Probably 80% of all the cases that we deal with are either directly drug-related or tangentially. Um, you know, they're there on a theft case that they were stealing to sell to buy drugs. Um, or they test positive for drugs in court. We, we drug screen people every docket. And if they test positive, there's a good chance that they're going to go out the back door, not the front door. Um, but our veterans treatment court, we treat our veterans differently. They, they, they present different issues. They deserve, they've, 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 uh, they deserve to be treated differently. Um, and, and so uh, a veterans treatment court is a term of probation. If they're convicted of a misdemeanor offense, we put them on probation, we put them in the vet, vet court. They get services that are not available to the general probation population. Uh, we work with the Dayton VA and it's uh, very effective. Uh, you know, you hear bad things about uh, the VAs, but my personal experience with them as it relates to Veterans Court is very positive, very effective, they're very thorough. Um, there's an educational component. Uh, when I came on the bench, <coughs> there were not very many kids coming into court, you know, on long field trips, things of that nature. Uh, we've been working to try to improve that. I think it's critical. I mean, one of the reasons I'm standing here right now, the one of the reasons I have the job that I have is just that, is uh, I came to court on, as, a, on a, as a child on a field trip. I met attorneys. Um, I had good teachers in high school, and here I am, for better or for worse. Um, <laughs> uh, just today, I met with uh, Debbie Hauser, Middletown School Superintendent, about bringing court to school. She was a little nervous about that, but actually having a criminal doc in, in school with uh, uh, students uh, observing it short of that, and, and that's something that's in the works, and it's not just with Middletown schools, it's all the schools in the court's jurisdiction. But uh, short of that, uh, we talked about uh, uh, students having field trips coming into the courtroom, and I, I think that's uh, very effective uh, 
uh, instrument that schools can use. And it would also include, I, I'd be willing to go out to the schools and, and talk to the students there too. A um, couple other issues. Um, for years now, the court's been trying to uh, instigate a community services program. We have probationers that are never gonna pay their fines. They're just not. Well, why not get them out there in your alleys and in your streets cleaning up the syringes and the needles and the garbage that they've helped put there? Uh, it's a win-win to me. Uh, we would need uh, a supervisor from, from the city and, and the material and probably a vehicle. Um, that's something that we work with Paul and he's, he's working on it too. Uh, I'd love to see that start. It's, a, it's just a resource that's there that's untapped and there's and, and needs to be uh, utilized by the city and I hope that we can work together to accomplish that. Uh, just a couple other things real quickly. Um, I'm big on community outreach. If uh, there's any organizations that want to, to know more about the court, I'd be perfectly willing to go talk to them. I do that already. I, I go to churches and, and uh, senior organizations, uh, uh, concerned Armco retirees, retired employees uh, meetings. So I'm perfectly willing to do that if uh, you ever think of anybody, any organizations that would benefit from that. Finally, I invite you, no, I challenge you, come to court, see, what, see what's going on there because what we do in court, you have to deal with here as, as uh, city council members and I think it would be just uh, very helpful to you, it'd be a great tool for you to know uh, a, another side, different uh, perspectives of the same issues that we're all dealing with, homelessness, drugs, alcoholism, recidivism, things of that nature. Uh, I think it would be a good eye opener and a good tool in your tool belts to, to come and visit court. I know the mayor's gonna be there tomorrow. So uh, uh, I think it would be helpful to all of you. And I thank you and I hope I didn't take up too much time. Thanks. And if you have any questions about the, the budget, talk to Steve. He knows all the answers. Thank you, Judge Sharon. Is that all, Mr. Lally? That is it for oh, okay. city manager's report. Well, thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is the public hearing okay. uh, for the map amendment and zone change at 5014 Roosevelt Avenue. Um, there are eight agenda items for a public hearing. I just want to kind of review them really quickly so we can know where we're at. Um, first, we will have the swearing in. Second, there will be the staff report. Uh, third, we will have the applicant speak. After that, we will hear anybody who is in support, and then after that, anybody who is opposed. Sixth, the applicant speaks one last time. Seventh, we close the public comment section. And then the eighth item is uh, council deliberations. Um, so our law director, Ben Yoder, uh, you have the floor for the swearing in, or unless there's something else we need to do beforehand. Nope, I think that's perfect. So if you are here and plan to give testimony, whether in favor, against, or neutral to the upcoming application, including the applicant, you can go ahead and stand up and raise your right hand. All right. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be true and accurate to the best of your knowledge and belief? Great, thank you. And then when you do um, speak from the podium, if you'll just give your name, your address, and then confirm the fact you've been sworn in. All right, thank you. So now it's time for the staff report. Okay, Mayor Schlampke, uh, this evening uh, on our public hearing for the map amendment and zone change at 5014 Roosevelt Avenue, uh, Ashley Combs, our assistant city manager, will uh, be giving the public hearing staff report. Good evening. James and Deborah apologize for not being able to be here tonight. So if you go ahead and go to the next slide for me. Uh, if you go to the next slide, okay, all right, you can, that's not correct.
You don't see anything. Okay. All right, well then I'm just gonna wing it right off of the staff report. So I apologize that there was no uh, PowerPoint provided tonight. Um, this is a request by applicant Wayne Hensley for the approval of a map amendment and zone change at 5014 Roosevelt Avenue. The property is a total of 0.8 acres approximately. Per the city of Middletown zoning map and development code, the property is zoned R3, medium density residential district, and the applicant is proposing a zone change to B2, general business district. The project requires review and approval by the city council before proceeding. The background, in August 2021, the property owner, again, Wayne Hensley, demolished the existing single family structure and accessory structures. Since then, the property has been undeveloped vacant land and its zone, like I mentioned, R3. The purpose of the R3 zoning district is to provide for moderate density, single family residential uses in, ur in an urban setting, which are served completely by public infrastructure and have adequate density of the development. The staff analysis, the applicant proposes a zone change again, R3 to B2, in order to consolidate this property with the adjoining parcel known as 2002 Cincinnati Dayton Road or the Tottle Inn. The surrounding property zoning designations are North B2 General Business District, vacant land, East B2 General Business District, vacant land, South R3 Medium Density Residential District, and West R3 Medium Density Residential District. The comprehensive plan, the 2021 Comprehensive Future Land Use Plan, labels the property within the mixed residential category and it's adjacent to the regional mixed use category. The proposed use of mixed residential is to support a mix of residential housing types and styles. And then the residential, or I'm sorry, the regional mixed use is to define a primary commercial use that caters to the I-75 traffic in the regional market. So again, Planning Commission is recommending denial of this zoning change. Um, it was four to one, and my understanding from James Metz, the city planner, it was because they didn't feel that there was an end use um, proposed and presented. Public notice was given 30 days prior to the public hearing and uh, for owners that were within 200 feet of the subject property and there were no comments received. The city's um, internal review committee also recommended denial of this project for the same reasons as the planning commission also denied it. Uh, the review criteria for the zone change map amendment, recommendations and decisions on code text or map amendment application shall be based on consideration of the following review criteria. Not all criteria may be applicable in each case and each case shall be determined on its own facts. One, the proposed amendment is consistent with the master plan and other adopted city plans. Two, the proposed amendment is necessary or desirable because of changing conditions. Three, the proposed amendment will promote health, safety, and general welfare. Four, the proposed amendment, if amending a zoning map, is consistent with the stated purpose of the proposed zoning district. Five, the proposed zoning amendment is not likely to result in any significant adverse impacts upon natural environment, including air, water, noise, stormwater management, wildlife, and vegetation, or those would be substantially mitigated. And six, the proposed amendment is not likely to result in a significant adverse impact on other properties within the vicinity. Um, per the staff report you were provided, that kind of wraps it up. Um, the applicant is here, or I will be happy to try to answer any questions as well. Council, let me make one point here. In other city department review comments in the staff report, that is a mistake there where it says that the internal review committee approved. It was denied by the internal review committee. Thank you. I think that was confusing. Yeah, thank you. And um, did anyone uh, from staff receive any comments or communications regarding this? I did not. Anybody else? No? No. Okay. So with that, we can move on to our applicant. Mr. Hensley, um, please do approach the podium if you have any comments for this evening. And again, if you would just confirm your name, your address, and the fact you've been sworn in, sir. Thank you. My name is Wayne Hensley. Uh, my address, since it's not snowing out, I can tell you, is 822 Northeast 11th Terrace in Cape Coral, Florida. That's why I wasn't here for the, any of the other things I had to come up with. 
then get delayed. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I don't understand all these denials uh, other than just not very well informed. We don't have a, a plan. We're not going to go build this or build that. I plan on selling the, the property and being all one approximately two acres of, of land would make it feasible for a, a motel, a uh, big restaurant, you know, with adequate parking, and, you know, all the, the good revenue generating things for the, for the city. I've, I've owned it for 35 years or more, and I'm not getting any younger, so that's why I just want to, you know, sell it, and whatever gets built there would then be up to you guys, the, the zoning and the, the planning, you know, whatever you approve to be built. Uh, I don't, the two properties are right, right together, just a stone's throw from uh, the one property to the other one, ain't even a stone's, it's right butted up against each other. So they, they're, there should be just an addition of eight, nearly a, an acre to the property, the current property that's there on the corner. So, no, I don't have a plan to go build anything. I mean, you know, I'm not getting any younger again, and and so I don't have the money to just lay out to build something, so I'd have to finance it. I don't need a 30-year loan, <laughs> I don't think. So, uh, but I do beg that you guys do approve it, and uh, let me go ahead and proceed with why I bought that property, just to make it bigger. Is there any questions or? Excuse me, Mr. Yoder, are we able to ask questions at this time? Yes. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Hensley, you had mentioned that uh, you're not, you don't understand why people are denying. Mm -hmm. And when they talk about best use, uh, things like that, and like a plan, um, basically, it's not necessarily, that, in my understanding, it's not necessarily that you have to have a plan, but that there is, for example, a plan for the, like if there's a developer that's coming and they have a plan for the, the lot. I think that's what yeah. people are speaking to. Well, we don't really have a, a developer yet. Mm -hmm. you know, we have to get it all one lot before I can even, my realtor was going to try to be here tonight, but he, he couldn't be here. Uh, to address that he's had some motels that possibly enter. He told him to hang in, to wait until I get the property all in one big location or big uh, plot. So. Thank you. And uh, does anybody else on council at this point have any questions or comments for Mr. Hensley? Okay, got you. Um, so at this point, well, knowing that anything could change as far as somebody coming and, and complaining that one of the residents or anything, do you need me here next week? I guess the second reading will be next week before you make your decision. Is that the way this works? Sir, tonight is the public hearing on it. No new or additional testimony would occur at a subsequent um, council meeting where they may take action to approve, deny, or whatever. So this will be the only time anyone will be able to give public testimony on this application. Okay, so the second reading, there's no... Correct. This, this same thing doesn't happen again. Correct. Okay. Well, what do you need for the second hearing? Anything? Nothing from you, no. Really, it, it will be council simply decides how they want to proceed, and then we'll pass legislative, legislation doing just that. So that's more or less the paperwork associated with whatever they're to do. So in case it snows, I can go back to Florida. The only if you'll take me with you. Well, <laughs> even in the morning, if it's like, I got a grandkid that needs me bad. <laughs> so, all right. Um, well, at this point, if, if you're finished for right now, what we'll do is we'll see if anybody's here in, to speak in support. Mm -hmm. We'll see if anybody's here to speak in opposition or any neutral comments. Mm -hmm. um, and then at that point, we'll ask you to come back up if you would like to give another statement if you wish. And we'll just go through those, those okay, how steps. How much advance notice are you going to give me to come back up? We're doing it right now. Oh, right now. <laughs> yeah, we're doing it right now. No. <laughs> yeah. So uh, at this point, we're just going to see if anybody is here to speak in support. Seeing none, 
Um, we'll go ahead and move on to see if anybody's here to speak in opposition. I'm seeing none. Uh, just to see if anybody is here to speak on neutral, give information, anything like that. Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. And is there anything else that you'd like to say um, this evening? Anything at all, one last time? I'm sorry, I have trouble hearing. Oh, forgive me. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we close the public oh. comment section? Anything oh, at all? Uh, well, yeah, one thing. Thanks for having the Pledge of Allegiance. I understand schools don't do that anymore. It's, it's just something that, anyway, but thanks for having that. And continue having it, please. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Hensley. Thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> All right. So this will basically close the public comment time unless there are any other public comments. Just checking. Okay. Now, before we do move on to deliberations, has anyone else from staff or the applicant received any communications regarding this? Okay. Seeing none, this concludes the public comment portion of the public hearing. We'll move on, move on to the last section, which is council deliberations. Um, there will be no interruptions at this point. We encourage you to stay, though there will be no further public comment. So at this point, um, we can start speaking. Um, I guess my one question is, is, what is the benefit of keeping it as a residential property? since it's gone through planning, it's gone through internal, and both have denied, so why did they do that? Versus, and the reason I'm saying that is, is we're seeing activity up in that area where uh, I believe it's La Rosa's that's moving there, and they're having a strip mall there. The theater died, so that's an open property uh, that, that's there, and this is less than a half a block away from that property. So why did the, why, why do we have two groups that are saying nope and keeping it residential? My understanding from talking to James right before this meeting was just based on the land use map and the comprehensive plan that it didn't meet. And then obviously I, th I think I'd said um, that they didn't feel that there was an end use that they were comfortable with recommending for approval, that they felt that the applicant was just trying to get the zoning to just, you know, up the land value and there was no real plan for it. And, and we'd but, wanna see once again, to that, a little bit more of a clear plan what might go there in terms of, I understand you, but there could be a difference between a motel and a hotel and other types of businesses that could go there that we wouldn't have uh, much control over, and that's our concern. Okay. That is all. Oh, got it. Uh, thank you. Um, so basically when Mr. Hensley was up here and he, he had mentioned that we'd be able to do whatever we want with it after, if we change the zoning, um, and as Mr. Lolly was saying, that's not necessarily true. Uh, if you change the zoning, then it's open to what, whoever applies for that space. So basically, from my understanding, I spoke with members of the Planning Commission who had basically said this could really kind of go either way. Um, but it was because of that best use, um, wanting a plan to see what's there first. And what I was told also is that, uh, maybe somebody could speak to this, but developers often know that this kind of thing can happen. So if they see two pieces of property like that next to each other, they realize that this is a conversation that we could have. You have a plan, right. and you can approach the city, and you can say, hey, this is, this is what we want to do. Um, can we talk about rezoning? And it is, and earlier, Ms. Combs, you had mentioned that this is, on the future land use map in the comprehensive plan, this, this plot is, is it regional mixed use? It was, uh, it is mixed residential. Mixed, it's right on the edge though. Correct? Right, that's, and that's another it. reason, I'm sorry I failed to mention, is that staff didn't feel that zone change was appropriate because we have limited land left as well for building homes in the city. Oh, okay, got you. So sorry you. I didn't say that. I'm looking down at my notes. Aaron, how much land, how much can you really build on less than an acre of land? When there's already housing there, right? There's there's infill lots currently being developed. Right. Okay. Less than an acre. Mm -hmm. I mean, over Sunset, there's one going up. I think Douglas is building one. Well, what I'm saying is, Eastern. is we're, we're trying to get, uh, as Zach's <coughs> points, we're trying to get a lot of housing in here. Yes. Mm -hmm. How much can I really put in a football field? 
which, uh, which, which is, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. If we're really trying to say we're growing and we're trying to do all these things, then one acre of land to me does one house, two house, or a multi-family uh, use, okay. But if we can have a business that is going to have growth there for hotel or strip mall or something, that's all I'm saying is, is if this was 10 acres, okay, you know, like a like Roosevelt Ridge or Lincoln property, that's, that's a total different conversation. But one acre of land, in, that's maybe four houses if you really kind of do the postage stamp feel of land, but that, that's, why I'm just gonna, that's why I'm just asking. Yeah, it's, it's like I said earlier, it's kind of, you could really see how this could lend itself to the business designation. At the same time, you can understand why you'd want a plan to make sure it's the kind of business that you, that you would want that fits in with the neighborhood. And there is a residential, there is a house abutting next to it as well, right up next to it. So it could make a difference for them if they have a car lot there or something like that. Uh, bright lights, noise, it could make a difference. Um, originally, I didn't, before I knew that this was an, uh, a mistake, a misprint in um, the staff report where it said that the city's internal development committee reviewed the proposal and recommended approval, um, that confused me a bit. And then I did look up the future land use map in the comprehensive plan and I thought to myself, well, I couldn't tell exactly I couldn't see exactly the street names, they weren't marked, but I did my best to figure it out. I thought it was under uh, regional mixed use, which would have, a, been <coughs> allowed, would have allowed for this, this change. Um, and in fact, knowing that because the future land use map was in the comprehensive plan, I would say, well, we have to, we have to go with that. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we have to do. Whatever the future land use map says, that's what it is. Um, but now knowing that that was denied and it's not, now I'm, leaning towards we have to do what the future land use map says because that is in, um, it's adhering to the comprehensive plan that, that we just set out a couple years ago. R remind me, Ashley, what, <clears throat> what's, can you break it down for me a little bit more simple? What's highest and best use of that land, it, the way it's written? Highest and best use, I mean, it, again, it would go with Mayor Slampka's, I mean, we would look at the comprehensive plan land use that we worked for the better part of three to five years on. Okay. I see it both ways. I, I remember my, my first week on council, um, you know, we, we changed the corner of Cincinnati Dayton Road in Manchester, one of the yes. busier intersections in Middletown, to a gas station, which ironically is still sitting there as not a gas station, but beside the point, but they brought forward, when we finally approved that, they brought forward the plan of this is what we want to do. Developer came down, pitched it, as well as the seller, uh, Don Shepard, I think. Um, so that's sort of why we did that, because they had a plan in place, and yet I look at this property. Um, it, that is the correct way to do it, in, in my opinion. Um, however, I, I mean, I look at this property and I'm, you know, what really can you do with it to, to Paul's point? I mean, I don't think you're going to, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but they're going to have to acquire that land. They're going to have to tear down the house that's on the land. They're going to have to tear down the title land if they truly want to turn it into something. So it's, it's going to have to be somewhat of a decent investment in my mind. And, you know, truthfully, we've got, since that date road, if I'm not mistaken, is the, the largest traffic, busiest road in all of Butler County. And, we have a bar that not very many people go to right now, which is, in my opinion, not really productive to uh, the town. And we could, I don't want to say we could turn it into anything that would be more productive because there are obviously limits to that. And then the concern of the neighbor doesn't really concern me too much because they're not concerned enough to come here when they've been mailed things and been reminded. So I'm not really too concerned about that so I, I don't know just some different things I don't I don't have the answer right this second but just some different things that are going through my head so that's all I have yeah I know for me I, I kind of see it both ways as well I whenever we look at zoning changes it's much easier to assess if there's a plan at hand but also looking at you have to look at every example and with this example I I can kind of see it both ways Kind of to your point, 
Zach, so. But, but I also, then I remember the, the last conversation we had about zoning that was done for something, we just talked about it, what was that, 13 years ago that now we look at it and I'm like, oh, well, I wish they wouldn't have done that back then. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't want to cripple the future of what that can be, but at the same time, the future is not too bright the way it is, in my opinion, with, with all due respect. I mean, uh, so I don't know, just some thoughts. Yeah, and again, that's, that's, it is, like I said, it could go either way. And I think, and, and having spoken with, um, because for planning commission, it was four to one in denial. Um, so I did want to ask them, you know, why did they vote that way and what were your thoughts? And so, you know, you, you want to help this development, help residents, and that is correct. And at the same time, we do have that comprehensive plan that we need to to really stick with. That's what was determined by um, the city staff and council. Um, so it's not necessarily an easy an easy one here. And like I said earlier, um, I think that, like I said, developers will know that they can look at that that piece of land and come up with a plan and say, okay, now we have this plan, let's approach the city again. And to council member Zach Farrell's point, um, when there is a plan that we see, then that makes it easier for us to kind of move forward. Um, are there any other comments at this time? No. Mr. Hensley would like to approach one more time. That, does that work? That's up to council's consideration if they'd like to open up the floor back to, for additional public comment. Okay. Um, I think that's fair. Uh, Mr. Hensley, if you'd like to come back up. I know, please be careful. What you're saying, if if I find a buyer that has a plan, oh, we're gonna build doll houses or something or whatever on the total property, you might be more apt to approve it. That's my understanding, having spoken with uh, staff and the Planning Commission. Yeah. And as I hear it now, you're probably not going to approve it. it it's, it's close. You know, as far as the residents and stuff, you know, they, they, if I was next door and didn't want it to happen, I'd have been here. So, Sir, I can tell you personally that if you put it on the market, in my professional real estate opinion, you, you would have about the same pool of buyers probably for that anyways. I don't think the upfront zoning change makes that much of a difference to a potential developer because I think any decent amount of money that's invested into that, it's gonna be a high enough product um, to where I, I think that we would, I'm speaking for myself, but most likely I would probably be open to it. Um, and also, based upon past experience of what councils have said before, if you come down, you have a better chance with a development of getting it through than you do based upon, I just want to change it because I want to change it. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing I'm wondering in my mind was, would that potential development be set in stone? I mean, if, oh no, it didn't, it didn't work out that way. And even, you know. Well, to my point, uh, the January of 2022, we approved a gas station on the corner of Manchester, Cincinnati, Dayton Road. They didn't have to start on it. They didn't have to do anything else. It's still sitting as it was woods. Now it's just grass, I guess. But it didn't affect the seller of the property, right? So even if it doesn't go through after it's closed, it doesn't matter for you. And they can't, if they want to try to change it later on, it doesn't matter to you. You're still able to sell it. Not your problem anymore. Mm -hmm. Well. You know, I want to work with you guys, and I want to work with whoever, any potential buyer. Sure. But I just thought it would be more uh, advantageous to have it all as two acres instead of one, one and one, or however mm -hmm. it shakes out. That you know, as a total property, this is there's no bickering or anything about what you're going to build. I realize there's some things that you can't get building permits for, mm -hmm. and that would kind of settle it if they wanted to build doll houses you know sure whatever. but there's still nothing stopping you from selling the property the way it is well 
as a total package. Mm -hmm. Both lots, even though one's residential. Yeah, you would just have to subject to uh, zoning variance, which is common in real estate to do. What's that? Uh, so, correct me if I'm wrong on this legal, but you, you just call it. You would it would be subject based upon a zoning change, just like you're trying to do right now. Um, I've done that with properties before. I know I've seen multiple people do that, so I don't think it's people that would be looking to develop this property. In my opinion, they wouldn't find anything weird about doing it after they were under contract. It's it's a common practice that developers understand, which you know, if you ask your realtor about it, they would probably agree. Well, okay. Well, I thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. And, and understand too, staff is more than willing to, to <clears throat> work with, Pardon? with staff is more than willing to work with you in the future. Yeah. Understood. It's just sometimes our hands are tied by not knowing what the future holds or what concrete plans are. I get it. Yep. Understood. Thank you, Mr. Hensley. You. Are there any more comments or questions from council? Seeing none, this concludes the public hearing. Ms. Gank, will you please present the consent agenda? For your consideration this evening, we have the approval of the City Council minutes of February the 20th and March the 15th, 2024. To receive and file the following Board and Commission minutes, the Airport Commission of December 11th, 2023 and January 22nd, 2024. Civil Service Commission of December 21st, 2023, January 17th, and February 12th, 2024, and the Park Board of February 12th, 2024. To, to confirm the personnel appointment of Zayden Duggins to the position of Firefighter Paramedic in the Department of Public Safety, Division of Fire. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> it has been properly moved and seconded to accept the consent agenda. We will proceed to vote. Ms. Gank, please call the roll. Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. West? Yes. Mr. Horn? Yes. Mayor Slamka? Yes. Mr. Farrell? Yes. The yeses have it and the motion passes. The consent agenda is approved. Our next item <coughs> is the motion agenda. Ms. Gank, please present item A on the motion agenda. To refer to Planning Commission a text amendment of the Middletown Development Code section 1204.08 permitted principal uses, specifically table 1204-3 principally per permitted uses in section 1230.02 definitions as they relate to medical marijuana facilities in the city of Middletown. Thank you. Mr. Lally, do you have anything to add? Yes, I'd like to invite Jacob Schulte, our economic development program manager down to give a presentation on this, uh, this motion. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Um, before you tonight is the uh, motion agenda item, basically just to discharge a recommendation to the Planning Commission regarding some text amendments to the zoning changes, specifically to medical marijuana. So as you're probably familiar, about a month ago, I came uh, before you from the kind of marijuana legislation task force to kind of give an update on where we were. Since then, by the advice of legal counsel, it was advised that we should probably move forward first with a text amendment to the zone change specific to marijuana businesses, and those being dispensaries, cultivators, processors, and testing labs, to then coincide with the um, conceptual legislation licensing program. That way everything kind of runs unilaterally and uh, just kind of a cleaner process overall. So before you tonight was kind of the concepts that we took from the uh, task force working on the legislation as well as some feedback from the Development Services Department to kind of help uh, provide some different zoning districts and uh, complementary uses on the permitted table for those dispensaries, cultivators, processors, and testing labs. Um, I added on the slideshow a couple of just different areas of the zoning map. Um, if you have any questions specific, so East End area, um, the South area, and then kind of the Northeast. If you have any specific uh, questions about particular zoning districts or kind of how we came to the conclusion of it, as well as uh, just a refresher on the dispensary restriction areas. Um, from the last uh, council update, 
uh, did a little bit more of a deep dive on this, how these restricted areas work. They are effective for all marijuana businesses, so not just dispensaries, but also the cultivators, processors, and testing labs. Um, specific to churches, uh, which include mosques and other religious um, locations of faith, uh, but also schools, and schools do include from the state Ohio Revised Code daycares, provided that the daycare is not within the licensee's resident. Um, what that means is at-home daycares are not considered for this map in the buffer zones, but uh, any, I guess, permanent commercial structure for a daycare would be. Um, and then public parks and uh, any other, uh, I think, public playgrounds would be included in this map. So from this map here, it's a 500-foot radius from all those publicly owned properties. Um, and then from there, we took the uh, kind of what the recommendations were a couple months ago. Again, met with development services to get some different ideas and stuff for where some of these businesses could go. And that's what is before you in the agenda. Thank you. Why not home daycares? That's a good question. Um, the state, basically ORC, when they look to what is a school, they specifically reference um, child care centers and primary education centers. From the ORC's definition, the child care center does not qualify its re basically at-home residents um, for the licensee and any, uh, I guess, di child care center with, I think, under seven, uh, I guess, participants. So it's a good question. I'm personally not familiar with why ORC and the Ohio Revised Code chose um, basically just the commercial daycares and not resident ones, but uh, they're just looking at the commercial non-residential daycares and um, primary schools. In order to have a daycare in your home, the state has to qualify that home, so I don't understand why they would not. It's just specific within the definitions. They just, for whatever reason, while it might be a licensed daycare center, <clears throat> The state excludes those in the definition of a um, school from being a child care center. So they can still obviously be a state registered and regulated um, child care center, but it is not, or a child care location. But for the purposes of the residential buffer zones and or the restriction areas, um, the residential child care centers aren't qualified for this. So if a child care center is at a commercial business, um, kinder care, for example, um, any of the other ones, or some of the ones we might have in town, uh, if it's at a commercial location, those would qualify. Um, any ones, and then primary schools, so Middletown schools, uh, MUM, uh, all those would be considered a school. Actually, I think MUM might be under the parks, but uh, all that to say, basically if it's in a commercial, but if it's in a residential, it's not part of the umbrella. So maybe we can give grace to those areas. Yes, in terms of the buffer map. Right. So. And from your last presentation, dispensaries are listed under retail? So within the um, permitted use table, last presentation, the concept was just to kind of take like a dispensary, um, look at it from a zoning perspective as a retail business. When under the advice of legal counsel, when we go in here for a text amendment, this is a specific breakdown within our uh, zoning map. So these would be, while it, we could consider them retail, because they're a specific breakout in the subset of the development code, they would just follow whatever the permitted use district would be. Right, and, but then also because we're, we're still in the medical marijuana, this is almost considered like a pharmacy. Yes. With, with a doctor being involved, from what I was told. And so uh, th that was my advice. It, it's neither retail nor medical. Those uses would be defined as those uses, just period. So okay. medical marijuana dispensary would be just that. So there's no guesswork as to is this retail, is this medical, those. It would quite literally, for purposes of the zoning code, be defined by those definitions. Because when we do the transition, not the transition, the ad addition of um, recreational use, 
um, when those start coming around next fall or so. So then it's a medical place, but it's also retail because it, as long as you're over 21 years old and have a driver's license, you can also purchase. It's up to council what you ultimately would want to do, obviously, as it relates to recreational marijuana. But my advice would likely be likewise defining it as being recreational marijuana and where you do and do not want that within the city if the city's to go forward with allowing recreational marijuana, you know, dispensaries, cultivators, processors, and labs. All right. Well, I guess the thought process is, is the reason why we're trying to get this established is the state is saying everyone who already has these established in your city, township, county, you're first in line for, so it is, it's actually a combo. So I would, I don't think it would really make sense, and maybe we'd, we'd put that language down the road, that you're gonna do both. We're not gonna have ors, we're, we, we wanna have it where you're doing both, because that's gonna bring the most commerce in anyways. On, this, on the dispensary side, on the manufacturing and the cultivation, that's a total different entity. Yeah, that makes total sense. And, and based off the, again, I'll just to orient everyone to what we're doing here is that tonight is to do nothing more than to the extent council so chooses to initiate the process by which the text amendment could be done. It would then go to planning commission. They can mark it up however they want, make whatever recommendations they want. There would be public comment and testimony before planning commission. And then additionally, this would then come back to this council for ultimate review further markup however you might want and then ultimate vote on that so all that tonight does is really just initiate the concept and it's the you know it's kind of the back of the napkin sketch if you will okay. um, not to minimize it but that's it but to your exact point the way that it's drafted right now under the definitions is doing nothing more than referencing the Ohio administrative codes assigned definitions for medical marijuana so if if the legislature once it develops out its administrative code defines that to also include recreational, the logical approach we'd likely proceed with is just updating our definitions to match theirs. So to your point, if in the future we want to allow both medical and recreational and one facility might do both of that, we would update our definitions much like the state would to match that. But one step at a time where we knew council wanted to likely proceed with medical marijuana, um, the thought is let's go with the existing definitional sections so it runs parallel with that so then at the end of the day planning will will send, a, send us a map but but we can decide what that map looks like yeah and, it, and it's um actually not so much the map amendment as currently proposed it's really a text amendment to the development code that would insert both the definitions for all those and then say within which districts um the medical marijuana uses would be permitted so it's not amending the map per se it's amending the text in the table of uses so that you'd know oh in a this district or that it's permitted it's prohibited conditionally those different types of things so their their recommendation of chapter and verse comes to us and then yeah. we can make the final absolutely on what that absolutely is. tonight is nothing more than initiating that process it'll go to planning commission for recommendation and then ultimately back to you all for final determination Thank you. Thank you. And um, yes, it looks like, well, I had a question also. Um, will the state decisions affect our text am amendment so it needs to be redone? Is this premature or is it correct that it does matter that we are next in line? If they change the definitions in ORC to reflect more of the recreational marijuana and those definitions change, we would just have to be proactive to go back, or retroactive, go back in, do the text amendment to change it to reflect ORC, and then it is reflective to standards. There's kind of two schools of thoughts there. You can either copy and paste quite literally the existing language out of the Ohio Administrative Code, but then if they ever update that, then we need to remember and think, oh, we need to update our text. More often than not, you'll see zoning lawyers, land use lawyers incorporate by reference the involved provision as it may be amended from time to time. That way, if it ever changes, our language is still good. Okay. One more thing, Mayor. Um, and on the, we have a moratorium that's expiring in June with the recent events that the state has now actually moved forward, surprising, and they're gonna start um, issuing applications in June. 
can we dump the moratorium and, and go forward, or have you been able to review the law? Maybe I'm dense here, but we don't have a moratorium in place. What we have is actually a, a prohibition in our criminal code that says... What did I vote no in, in in January or in December? What was that? It was a recreational. Yeah, it was recreational. We're going to wait six months. Okay, so we have the prohibition in our criminal codes code section pertaining to medical marijuana. Right. This was then we have a recreational. Okay. And you, and you now guys, I get what you're getting you at. You wanted to wait till the state decided what where, where they want to do, so we didn't have to go back and forth. Yes. So the yeah. states kind of decide what they what they want to do. So I'm just saying, let it go away now. So we have a medical marijuana criminal provision. Yeah. This, and then this we have is a this recreational. Is, this was issue two. Recreational marijuana moratorium in place. I thought we were just talking about the medical side. I'm sorry. Of it. If Jeff, to the extent um, the state doesn't have its its stuff in order come June, the council will need to decide does it want to allow that moratorium to roll off knowing that there's no state involved regulations in place there or would they like to extend it further until the state gets its stuff figured out? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, just wanted to say that when this does go to Planning Commission, like Mr. Yoder was saying, then there will be the public hearing, there'll be public input, bless you, they'll be, they'll be able to add, they'll be able to change all kinds of things that they can look at with, with this going to them. Um, and it is going to be a, a, a big issue. It's, it's new. It's not very often that we get to do this, this kind of thing. It, so I know speaking with the Planning Commission, they are looking forward to staff input, to public input, um, and the entire process. So, are there any other comments or questions this evening? Okay, thank you. Okay, hearing none, do I have a motion to approve item A to refer to Planning Commission a text amendment of Middletown Development Code as they relate to medical marijuana facilities within the city of Middletown? Motion. Is there a second? Second. Having been properly moved and seconded, is there any further discussion? <clears throat> hearing none, uh, we will proceed to vote. Ms. Skink, please call the roll. Mr. West? Yes. Mr. Horn? Yes. Mayor Slamka? Yes. Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. Farrell? Yes. The yeses have it and the motion passes. At this point, um, I would like to take maybe a seven minute recess, 10 minute recess. Um, is there anything I need to do, Mr. Yoder, to do that? No. Okay, just we'll see, it's 7.12 now, so we'll be back in our seats by 7.22. Thank you.
everything back to order. The next agenda item is legislation. We have eight items of legislation this evening. Law Director, Mr. Ben Yoder, the legislation, please. Thank you, Mayor. First item is ordinance number 0 2024 20 an ordinance authorizing the submission of an application for federal assistance, an action plan, and a projected use of funds under Title I of the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974, as amended um, for program year 2024. This is a second reading. Thank you, Mr. Yoder. Uh, Mr. Lawley, is there a staff report? Uh, we have nothing further to add on legislative item number one. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion to approve the ordinance? Motion. Is there a second? Second. It has been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, um, we will go ahead and proceed to vote. Ms. Gank, please call the roll. Mr. Horn? Yes. Mayor Slamka? Yes. Mr. Farrell? Yes. Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. West? Yes. The yes is have it and the legislation passes. Item two is resolution, let's try that again. Item two is resolution number R2024-10, a resolution to make adjustments to appropriations for current expenses and other expenditures of the city of Middletown, counties of Butler and Warren, state of Ohio, for the period ending December 31st, 2024. This is the court's special project funds and it, again is a second reading. Mr. Lawley, is there a staff report? We have nothing further to add. Okay, is there a motion to approve the resolution? Motion. Is there a second? Second. It has been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we will proceed to vote. Ms. Skank, please call the roll. Mayor Slamka? Yes. Mr. Farrell? Yes. Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. West? Yes. Mr. Horn? Yes. The yeses have it and the legislation passes. Item three is resolution number R2024-11, a resolution authorizing an amendment of a grant agreement with the Ohio Department of Transportation for a grant under the Urban Transit Program for state fiscal year 2022. This is a second reading. Mr. Lawley, is there a staff report? We have nothing further to add. Thank you very much. Um, is there a motion to approve the resolution? Motion. Do you have a second? Second. It has been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, we will proceed to vote. Ms. Gank, please call the roll. Mr. Farrell? Yes. Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. West? Yes. Mr. Horn? Yes. Mayor Slamka? Yes. The yeses have it and the legislation passes. Item four is resolution number R2024-12, a resolution authorizing an amendment of a grant agreement with the Ohio Department of Transportation under the Ohio <coughs> Transportation Partnership Program for state fiscal year 2023. Second reading. Mr. Lally, anything from staff? We have nothing further to add. Thank you very much. May I have a motion to approve the resolution? Motion. A second? Second. It has been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, we will proceed to vote. Ms. Skank, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. West? Yes. Mr. Horn? Yes. Mayor Slamka? Yes. Mr. Farrell? Yes. The yeses have it and the legislation passes. Item five is ordinance number 0 2024 21 an ordinance authorizing the amendment of a contract with Renaissance Inc. for demolition of the site known as Middletown Paper Board and declaring an emergency. Mr. Lally, anything from staff on this? Yes. Uh, Council, we have two change orders with uh, Renaissance in the demolition of the paper board uh, site. Uh, uh, this is for the removal of additional asbestos uh, containing material that uh, was not included in the original bid. During firefighter operations in January of 2020, uh, there was significant structural collapse of the interior structure, and because of this, not all areas could be inspected prior to the RFP uh, being put out. Uh, therefore, the amount of uh, asbestos uh, um, removed uh, was in estimation. Uh, two additional areas were found that contained uh, asbestos-laden uh, material and equipment that necessitates an agreed upcharge uh, change order, and that totals $189,195.33. Uh, um, 
The still has the project just under $3 million, barring any future unforeseen problems. And this is a first reading emergency so that the project can be uh, continued immediately. Thank you, Mr. Lally. May I have a motion to approve the ordinance? Motion. Is there a second? Second. It has been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Okay, I just wanted to add that because this is an emergency, we do need a four-fifths vote of council. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we will proceed to vote. Ms. Gank, please call the roll. Mr. West? Yes. Mr. Horn? Yes. Mayor Slamka? Yes. Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. Farrell? Yes. Yes, Yeses have it, and the legislation passes. Sixth item is resolution number R2024-13. A resolution to make adjustments to appropriations for current expenses and other expenditures of the city of Middletown, counties of Butler and Warren, state of Ohio, for the period ending December 31st, 2024, and declaring an emergency. This relates to the general fund, but although requesting um, it be passed as an emergency, it's a first reading, no actions expected until the April 16th, 2024 council meeting. Thank you, Mr. Yoder. Mr. Lally, is there a report from staff? Yes. Uh, this legislation this evening, Council, is to add two positions to the Division of Police, one Deputy Chief position and one Lieutenant position. The main purpose of this is to uh, address recommendations by the Division of Police review that was done in mid to late 2023. Um, it was... Uh, Determined that the division's current organizational structure does not provide appropriate levels of span of control and appropriate career, career development opportunities for officers. This uh, will allow us to uh, establish three bureaus within the deputy chief position oversight and establish two lieutenant positions to prepare for deputy chief roles in the future. This will allow... Um, this also allows us to uh, uh, form more uh, imp or form additional career development and result in a successful organic succession plan within the division of police hierarchy. Um, the, um, the succession planning will allow us to identify, develop, and prepare internal employees uh, to fill key positions and leadership roles within the Division of Police. This is also an emergency this evening due to meeting timely deadlines for the police promotional positions that are at hand. Thank you, Mr. Lally. Is there any discussion this evening? Okay, as there's no action required on this resolution until April 16th, we will continue. Mr. Yoder. Seventh item, seventh item is ordinance number 0 2024-22 an ordinance changing the zoning classification for the parcel located at 5014 Roosevelt Avenue from R3 medium density residential district to B2 community business district. The first reading. Thank you. Mr. Lally, anything more from staff? I don't have anything more to add from the public hearing. Okay. As this is a first reading, there is no action on this item today. Uh, is there any discussion? Any further discussion? And Mr. Yoder, did you want to speak to this? Yeah, I thought this might be a good idea or a good opportunity for me to uh, sideswipe your meeting and to propose kind of a, using this and this public hearing and associated legislation of an example of how we might be able to change things moving forward to provide, quite frankly, better services. So just being completely transparent on everything that's here, obviously you had your public hearing on this earlier in the agenda. And then as has been custom as long as I've known it here, then you'll later after that have the legislative the legislation included on the legislative agenda. However, legislation, whether it's a resolution or an ordinance, takes two readings. The staff is always trying to be as business friendly as possible, frankly, kind of attempted to guess at what council might want to do, approve, deny, and then incorporate that into the agenda so that you could, like tonight, have a first reading on it such that it could actually be voted on at the next meeting. The, the problem with doing it that way is, although on, quite frankly, it looks to be business friendly and is an attempt to be business friendly, it can kind of create a false impression that, you know, hey, because it's on the agenda is an approval of the rezoning, you know, we don't want the public to think that, oh, that must mean that this, this whole thing is already, you know, fixed. Council's already made its decision. Why would I come and testify something like that? 
Additionally, it can create, like for Mr. Hensley, who was here earlier, you know, confusion as to like, okay, so what are we doing tonight? Uh, am I gonna know tonight what are we doing or do I need to come back in two weeks? And you kind of have to explain, well, no, our legislation requires two readings. We'll, we won't have another public hearing on it, but you know, we'll make a decision in two weeks. And it just is kind of confusing. And then you show up in two weeks after you heard everything as council members that are deliberating on this and you're attempting to recall what happened two weeks ago. Additionally, members of the public may show up and go, oh, hey, I heard this was on the agenda. I'd like to speak to it. And you're like, well, that, that public hearing, as much as we value your input, already happened two weeks ago. So it kind of creates just this <coughs> odd situation. So what most entity do, entities do is what they'll do is just literally hold the public hearing, just the way that you did tonight. And then at the end of it, after you deliberate, you just vote. Do it as a straw poll that says, okay, what do we wanna do? Okay, is there a motion to approve or deny? Is there a second? Yes, okay, all in favor. And then you just vote orally. What that then would allow staff to do is rather than guess what council would like to see happen, we can actually draft the legislation as it occurred that would say, you know, okay, they voted to deny the rezoning, approve the rezoning, whatever it is that would come to council. We could still put that on the meeting agenda for the next meeting, and if we'd like, we can pass that as a first reading emergency to be business friendly such that that decision is effective immediately upon passage at that next meeting. But it takes out all the guesswork. It makes the deliberations occurring in front of the public right live time as it's all happening. So again, like I said, I thought this would be a good opportunity to sideswipe our um, council meeting under a live time example to show you how we could maybe do it better. Um, you guys are the bosses. However you want to proceed is legitimately up to you. My thought would be if you want to vote on this item seven the way it is now, great. If you want to orally vote and we could put legislation that actually memorializes you know, a resolution denying, a resolution approving, whatever you want, then we could bring that back next meeting and still pass it as a first reading. All that said, I will now be quiet and am open to answering any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Yoder. Um, yes, again, it's the first reading, there's no action today, but uh, just asking council, what are your feelings? Would you like to take the week and come back and just vote at that point? Or would you like to take that straw vote now and have staff change the ordinance if we need to? Um, what are your thoughts? I hear one vote. I want to think about it. One think about it. <laughs> I, I could, yeah. I, I, Not only think about it, but we just told him that we wouldn't vote tonight. So I don't want him to, you know what I mean? Very good point. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. West. Does that sound agreeable to everybody? We'll just go ahead and wait and we'll just vote on this in the next week, the next meeting. It looks like that's our choice. And then moving forward, is council amenable to the way in which I've proposed? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. And actually, well, I can talk to you later at another time, but like what else would be an option? Would you just put something, because I remember we can have legislation on there and as long as it's mostly the same, it can move on to the next meeting. That's what I was, that's what I understood. Yeah, you, you could do it that way. The problem is you're still left guessing and putting something on the agenda to start with. Either way. Um, okay. So then it, it, it takes out that false impression that the whole issue is kind of predetermined when legitimately it's not. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion on this tonight? No. Okay. So I would think there would be a motion. Oh, wait, no, that wouldn't be a motion because it's a first reading. Right. Thank you. That's okay, Mr. Yoder. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to move on to the eighth and final item? Eighth and final, yes. All right, that's ordinance number O-2024-23, an ordinance providing for the issuance and sale of notes in the maximum principal amount of $14,080,000 in the anticipation of the issuance of bonds for the purpose of paying the costs of designing, engineering, constructing, acquiring, renovating, and improving various municipal infrastructure permanent improvements for the Renaissance Arena District project including water mains, sanitary sewers and storm sewers, public roads and streets and related curbs and gutters, grading, landscaping, and otherwise improving the sites thereof in equipment and appurtenances as may be necessary in connection therewith and declaring an emergency. No actions requested until the April 16th meeting. 
Thank you, Mr. Lally. Is there a staff report? Thank you, Mayor Slampka. And I'm going to turn this over to our bond expert, Nathan Cahill. God help us all. Uh, Mayor, uh, members of council, uh, before you is a uh, piece of legislation that modifies a previous um, ordinance passed by a council uh, late last year uh, related to this project. Um, as the project is progressing, there are a couple parameters of the uh, proposed debt issuance that have changed that, that bond council is advising that we we augment. Uh, number one, uh, glad to see uh, a report that uh, the expected uh, par amount of the issuance is uh, less by about $800,000. And, and we believe will be actually much less than, than this maximum number, but this gives us some cushion. Uh, the second issue is that um, in comparison to the deal structure that we were looking at in conjunction with the Port Authority in the late fall last year, um, we actually have a different underwriter uh, in place for the city's infrastructure uh, debt, and they require a uh, note purchase agreement which was not contemplated. The ordinance was silent. And so just have an abundance of caution, we wanted to make sure that there's a replacement ordinance that allows the uh, finance director to to execute such a such a ancillary agreement to the to the um, to the deal, and then finally um, we are contemplating using the OMAP, the uh, Ohio Market Access Program, to save on issuance costs, which was not part of the structure at this time. But upon uh, further review by staff, uh, we're pushing that. Um, that should uh, yield. Uh, a, don't know the exact amount right now, but a substantive uh, issuance cost savings for the city. And so with that, uh, we're requesting uh, your focus consideration and hopeful approval at our next regular meeting um, so that we can uh, enter the capital markets here before the uh, midpoint of the second quarter. Thank you, Mr. Cahill. And that is the reason for the second reading emergency. That is correct. Yes, Thank you. Okay, this is, there's no further action required in this legislation at this time, but is there any discussion at this time? Any questions? This is the first time I've heard something come back less. <laughs> <laughs> Since probably 1997. Keep up the good work. Uh, All right. We'll make up for it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, okay. And is there... Is there um, an idea when when council will get the development agreement to review? Um, we're at a we're at a point where um, we're we're contemplating um, either a uh, um, how best to phase some of those improvements, and we believe that we'll be in a position to uh, finalize that internally with our development partners, being the the county port authority and water development here, probably by the end of the month, and uh, be able to circulate and walk council through. Uh, the finalized development agreement uh, probably sometime in May is what we're shooting for. Whether Hopefully the first meeting in May. Yeah, that's what we that's hope what for. we're hoping. Yeah. Thank you. And I believe you, you said, we, okay, we might be able to see drafts or something like that as well. Yeah, I, I think I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a point in time probably uh, in early May where um, staff is going to be presenting to, to council uh, your consideration of uh, ratifying a final development agreement amongst the parties. Um, right now we have a preliminary that uh, um, would transition to a final development agreement upon um, the parties waiving certain contingencies and the like, and we're working through those final details. Um, so um, what is in front of you tonight sets the stage to where that's a, a, um, a simultaneous action of approving um, a final development agreement, and also the authorization then to fulfill some of the funding requirements under that final agreement. But it, I, I want to stress that staff is um, not contemplating with this authorization uh, issuing any any public debt unless uh, it's predicated upon the execution of that final development agreement. Thank you, Mr. Cahill. And what all that means is hopefully a shovel will go on the ground in June. Excellent, thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, this concludes the legislation for the evening. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business. Do any council members have anything they would like to bring up under unfinished business? I do. Mr. Horn. Got a list. So where are we at on the aquatic center? Okay, so the, uh, the agreement has been bounced back between both attorneys and our attorneys sent it 
back today to the YMCA's attorneys. So we're hoping to get something by the end of this week that both parties can uh, agree on and move forward. Okay, that has not impaired the schedule that we're trying to get forward by? Not according to the YMCA, no. Okay. So they got we're, that. We're doing, so far we're doing good. Okay, next, uh, where are we at on Roosevelt Ridge? I'm two blocks away from it. I'm not seeing one shovel being kicked in the ground. I mean, the, the city recently closed on the property with the developer. Um, they have their timelines. Um, okay, Evan. can you share what that timeline is? I mean, do they plan to start digging this summer or next fall or? Yeah, I mean, where it was set up is for them to meet their timelines. Um, you know, I would imagine as soon as they feel that the weather has broke sufficiently for them to start an earthwork that they will commence. Okay. Um, I mean, that's where we're at. I don't know if Ashley and her offices have seen any final or any permitting above and beyond what engineering has reviewed and sent out the door. Yep. That's why we call it unfinished business. Yeah. And, and so Renaissance Point, I heard July start potentially digging, not the, not the uh, hockey arena, but, but the everything else is going to start the I mean, that's what we're setting up i mean we're we're in the final throes of finalizing a few contingencies with our development partners and that's what we hope to present to you in may okay it's all on my list okay while we're checking let's check on the community center what's happening with that um we actually uh, i think uh what's today Wednesday or tuesday so thursday we have another group meeting um, we are working with our construction manager and our design team. Um, we are shooting uh, for a uh, bid advertisement uh, release for, for people to start reviewing and preparing their bids uh, in uh, the later half of May of this year Sounds and have, a, have probably, hopefully, a June groundbreaking official. I think we may be looking at maybe a, a ceremony a little bit ahead of that, but that is the uh, timeline that staff has given our our team to get going. Oakland Park. Right now I'm working with Charlie Anderson in the parks. Um, he is getting me different estimates for the different equipment and things that the neighborhood had requested, so I anticipate getting that any day from him and I'll be forwarding that on to Paul to share with you as soon as I get it and then we'll be looking to move forward. I read where they're thinking of putting the name of the park on benches in the park. Great idea. Yeah, we're great. definitely trying to keep consistent with what we're doing in Goldman and Sherman too. So we look forward to getting all those projects started so oh, the residents good. can benefit from that neighborhood funding we set aside. Good. Thank you. Is there anything else under new business? No? Okay, uh, that concludes new business. And the next item is, I'm sorry, that's unfinished business. The next item is new business. Um, do any council members have any new business they'd like to share? Yes, Mr. Horn. Well, I sent you an email about uh, starting the process of EV chargers. And uh, my request is, is that you have information and a presentation by the second meeting in May. That is correct. And, um, and you, from, from our conversations, you've already looked into the grants and everything else. And like I said, even just for a beta test, obviously we, you want to have multiples, but even just for a beta test right outside of, in our parking lot where the old mid, mid first uh, power services is, it's perfect because you have four parking spaces, you have a service set up, you have a meter set up, so you can actually see the cost, you can uh, monitor it, you can see the, the demand on it. So the, the thing is, is that the EV cars have been around for 16 years. They're not going away. Uh, yes, they'll be looked at more than used, but I also understand we have at least one employee that uh, uses or has an EV car. And then after that, my, my feeling is, is once you do your presentation and you, your team does their work, that in our, what I call the entertainment district, downtown area, start looking at that. And then also obviously our parks. Um, we might as well just go ahead and start. I sent you a, a picture from uh, one that's at Armco Park. They don't charge for theirs. That's completely up to the, the city and what also council feels strongly about. But we might as well just go ahead and proceed and if there's grant money out there that no one else wants, we might as well take it and use it. 
Um, but I think we have an opportunity because I mean, I mean I'd like the mid fest when we had it, but now we have all this electrical power out there that we're not utilizing, and we can actually make it where this is where this this can be our starting point. Yes, I'm looking forward to that presentation the second week in May. And we actually had a meeting with the uh, organization the other day, and actually they've helped us identify some other funding sources besides OKI, those OKI grants. Yeah. Thank you. Any other new business tonight? Any other council? I have a couple of items. Um, one of the items that council, uh, council, council, I said council, council really cares about is communication with residents and um, that's how we share information and also how we gather input. So I know we had spoken about the possibility of kind of like a communication plan. Um, we had spoken about the possibility of maybe a city newsletter. We had spoken about the possibility of maybe a website where people can leave views on issues anonymously so everybody can kind of see what people are talking about. Um, perhaps public listening sessions, surveys, town halls, and so forth. So I'd like to know more about where residents stand on issues like medical marijuana tonight. Um, and I know that's going to be beneficial for, for us and also for Planning Commission, for example. So moving forward, um, perhaps at the next council meeting, perhaps we could have an update on where we are with some of those items in the communication plan. Yeah, um, that it's possible the next meeting or the first meeting in May, because the next meeting is next Tuesday. It's Tuesday, yeah. Yeah, let me get with uh, um, Clayton and mm -hmm. see where we're at on that. I know the newsletter's coming. They've mm -hmm. got some work on that. but. Let me discuss that and we'll do it either April, uh, what is it, 16th or the first meeting in May. Mm -hmm, May 7th. And that's, that's great to hear that, just alone to hear that there's a newsletter coming. That's a great update, really quick, nice, thank you. Actually, we expect it to be on your motion agenda uh, next Tuesday. Oh, fantastic, there's, so we there we go. we the printing contract and chain uh, Clayton to his desk. Oh, excellent. Get it out <laughs> Uh, I'm supportive of it, but just curious, it'll have cost of what it costs to do that much printing, I assume. Yes, yes. So just, I, you know, just to elaborate a little bit. So the plan of action is um, to send out quarterly um, an eight-page kind of glossy, um, call it a newsletter, but um, to our approximately about 18,000 residential utility account addresses, customers as well as to allow people to opt in online on our website for an electronic version so we can cut down our mailing costs over time. Um, but the plan of action is to have that hit uh, people's mailboxes, whether electronic or physical, uh, quarterly. That was great in and of itself. Thank you very much. Um, the other item um, of new business for me, the last one I have, is the budget is coming up. And so uh, city manager and I had spoken about perhaps having a, a preliminary meeting so council can discuss and give staff uh, our overall direction of where we want to see the budgetary things done and how in terms of the budget. Um, so city manager had said we need a direction before the end of May. So I was thinking possibly having that meeting um, on the 21st, the second meeting of May, maybe before, before our council meeting. Um, Mr. Lawley, how long do you think we would need for that meeting? Uh, I, I'd say an hour. An hour? I think an hour would, would suffice. Yeah, I, I think what we're thinking of is nothing to where we're getting into line items or weeds, but I think mm -hmm. um, instead of, I think the city manager and obviously his support staff trying to guess at some things or we get out our Ouija board to, to decide certain priorities is to hear from you to kind of give us some some guidelines and some guardrails um, and see how we can maybe put together a budget proposal that kind of helps with your folks' priorities as a new council. Yeah. So and and it, it, you know, pretty much 91% of the budget is fixed. You know, so that kind of gives you an idea of, you know, what we're dealing with and, and uh, but then, you know, there's gonna be major decisions to be made what how do we want to look at the general fund reserve and the things tied to that when do, when does staff start budgeting for the following year what month usually the second of january <laughs> no. <laughs> no at least i start but I, I in, in finance director but yeah no i mean we we start officially probably towards the end of june mm -hmm. yeah 
first of July in there we start meeting with department heads and we get things out to department heads and start to get information back from them okay so if we meet second meeting of May theoretically that'll give us income tax yeah uh, we will we, we traditionally rule of thumb in municipal government at least in Ohio is that you know where your income tax is going to land barring some black swan event give or take about two or three tenths of a percent by the end of June. You know where you're going to, to land for the rest of the year. For the rest. Should we wait until maybe first meeting in June then? Would that be more productive? It may very well be. Um, the finance director and I have talked, um, I think to also provide you, um, we'll, we'll be able ahead of that meeting to um, at a minimum provide the entire first quarter financial kind of, so you at least have a quarter of a year to look at. Um, Although I think from the expenditure side, it's better. We're going to make every attempt to get you through April um, so that you can also see as we get into construction season, whereas a lot of our capital outlay occurs, we're already bidding projects. And so you can see those encumbrances as well because we don't want some misleading information where you may find a, a fund report that has all this money just sitting here. Mm -hmm. It's going to be gobbled up, you know, 30 days later. With a, con with a road contract or water project or something. Um, but that's our goal. Um, I think the things that I believe we're looking at for guidance so that we can then present, the city manager can present to you a, a policy document being the budget that I think incorporates the priorities of you've expressed along with what's what the administration's recommending um, are big ticker, big ticket items like, um, like, like Mr. Lawley just said our general fund reserve amount, how much is our goal for carry forward as a cushion, what are the implications there, you know, pros and cons, um, and have discussions about council's priorities or listing of potential uses for those dollars. Are they one-time expenditures or are the types of things that are ongoing costs that we need to just plan for mm -hmm. um, so that we can provide you at the end of the day <clears throat> actionable information so that you can make the policies decisions that you think are right for the community and that's that's why we kind of would prefer to do that the second meeting in May because we getting feedback from you that kind of gives us a good 30 plus days to be ready to research make adjustments whereas if we didn't do that until June then our window kind of closes down when we have to start dealing with department by department sure in decision making. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, council, we can look, kind of look at our calendars and maybe email city manager if the hour before 4.30 at, on um, May 21st would work for everybody. And then we can go ahead and send out that request. Yeah, 4.30, May 21st, mm -hmm. we'll. Mm -hmm. Okay. If that's suffice with that body, just get back with me and we'll get it scheduled. All right, thank you very much. Is there anything else under new business for anybody here? Nope. Okay, hearing none. The next item on the agenda is executive session. <coughs> so I'm going to read this correctly. Do I hear a motion to move to executive session under the authority of ORC 121.22 G1 to consider the appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion, or compensation of a public employee or official? and under the authority of ORC 121.22G2 to consider the purchase of property for public purposes or for the sale of property at competitive bidding if premature disclosure of inf information would give an unfair competitive or bargaining advantage, and under the authority of ORC 121.22G3, conferences with an attorney for the public body concerning disputes involving the public body that are the subject of pending or imminent court action. <clears throat> Is there a motion? Motion. You have a second? Second. It has been properly moved and seconded to move to executive session. We will proceed to vote. Ms. Gank, please call the roll. Mr. Horn? Yes. Mayor Slamka? Yes. Mr. Farrell? Yes. Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. West? Yes. The yeses have it and the motion passes. Council will now move to executive session. We will be returning to open session to appoint new boards or commission members and to adjourn the meeting.
We're on. Okay. Do we have a motion to return to open session? Motion. motion. You have a second? Second. It has been properly moved and seconded to return to open session. We will proceed to vote. Ms. Ms. Gank, please call the roll. Mayor Slamka? Yes. Mr. Farrell? Yes. Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. West? Yes. Mr. Horn? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the yeses have it. We are back in open session. Uh, the next item is board and commission appointments. The historic commission has one position available and one person has applied. Uh, we continue to receive applications on an ongoing basis. I move to appoint Jennifer Chen to the historic commission. Do we have a second? Second. It has been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we will proceed to vote. Ms. Kink, please call the roll. Mr. Farrell? Yes. Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. West? Yes. Mr. Horn? Yes. Mayor Slamka? Yes. Yes is have it and the motion passes. The Planning Commission has one position available and two people have applied and we continue to receive applications on an ongoing basis. I move to appoint Brian Duba to the Planning Commission. Do we have a second? Second. It has been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we will proceed to vote. Ms. Gank, please call the roll. Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. West? Yes. Mr. Horn? Yes. Mayor Slamka? Yes. Mr. Farrell? Yes. The yeses have it and the motion passes. And Mr. Farrell, would you mind putting on your microphone? I think it's off. No, it's on. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> and then uh, the Building and Housing Appeals Board has one position available and two people have applied. And we continue to receive applications on an ongoing basis. I move to appoint Dickie Brandon to the Building and Housing Appeals Board. Do we have a second? Second. It has been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we, pu we will proceed to vote. Ms. Gank, please call the roll. Mr. West? Yes. Mr. Horn? Yes. Mayor Slamka? Yes. Mrs. Carter? Yes. Mr. Farrell? Abstain. The yeses have it and the motion passes. That concludes our special meeting of Middletown, Ohio City Council for Tuesday, April 9th, 2024 at 9.56 p.m. This meeting is adjourned until Tuesday, April 16th, 2024 at 5.30 p.m. in these chambers for our next regular council meeting. Thank you and good night.